friends. Welcome to the Veterinary Life Coach Podcast. Today, I have a wonderful guest for you. Her name is Dr. Monica Tarantino, and she's a veterinarian and the co-founder of Senior and Geriatric Dog Veterinary Society and Vets on the Rise. She's also the founder of Senior Dog Revolution, and she promotes senior dog health issues on her podcast. She has a blog, and she is very active on social media. She's also the co-founder of the Pet Loss Community, which is a support group she founded with another veterinarian and a clinical psychologist to help support pet parents dealing with grief and other issues. Welcome to the podcast, Monica. Thank I'm you so much so for having happy me. happy to have you. Yeah, I'm thrilled <laughs> to be here. I'm just I listening to the bio. I'm like, wow, there's a lot of things. There's See? <laughs> Well, until we start listing exactly. out all our accomplishments, we don't really realize how great we are, right? <laughs> Very, true. Very true. I love it. So I always ask everyone when we start the podcast to tell me their veterinary story. So whatever you, wherever you want to start, however much you want to say, tell me how you got into this lovely business. Absolutely. So um, veterinary medicine is actually a second career for me. So I went and I started off in business, in the business world. And then when I was age 26, I found that I had an MBA. I had a good paying job and I was just unhappy in what I was doing. Like I'd go, I'd wake up every day and I'd be like, there's gotta be more to this, right? Cause you spend so much, so much time at work. Um, and I remember there was this pivotal moment that I had where I was working in a government contracting industry. And I was, it was the end of the day, I was walking in the elevator and there was a guy that was in front of me, probably about 20 feet in front of me. And this guy happened to have a job that I probably would have in 20 years had I stayed to this career path. And he gets to the elevator, he pushes the button, elevator opens, he walks in, turns around, he doesn't see me. And he does this big, like, oh. and it just looked like this, like super self-defeating, like moment that was like a very private moment that I happened to just sneak up on. <laughs> and I remember looking at him and just being like, oh my God, it was this moment where I had this clarity. It was like, if, if I stay in this field, like that's going to be me. This is your future, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so after that, I decided to try to figure out really what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and I took a job at a medical center. I took a job as a receptionist at a vet clinic. And um, I applied to law school because I had my MBA. I was like, maybe that's the best fit for me. I should do that. And as soon as I worked, stepped into an animal hospital, it just felt like home for me. I was like, this, this is the place. Really? You just like, connected with it. Yeah. Because I really think that people that go into veterinary medicine, they're very unique. They're very empathetic. They're very smart. They, I think sometimes can end up feeling a little bit different and like weird growing up because of their true <laughs> bond to animals and pets. Like I, I remember, you know, it's something as simple as like driving in the car and like you see every single bird or rabbit on the side of the road. And so, um, and no one else notices it. You're like, did you see that? They're like, no, what are you talking about? So, <laughs> but you know, as soon as I stepped into the clinic, I was like, these are my people. Like, this is, this is what I want to do. And um, from there, I took some classes at night, worked full time as a vet assistant and a receptionist, and then applied to vet school and, and got in. And the rest is, is history. Yeah. So did you get, did you get in right away? You probably did. Cause you already had an MBA. <laughs> I did. I got in my first time that I applied. It took me nice. two and a half years though, to go to do the prereqs and, and whatnot. Oh, cause yeah. Had cause you had to take the animal classes, right? Yeah. I had to take all I the science classes that. and, um, you know, uh, at night and then working full time and I'd moved back in with my parents. I went from like the state where I was like, you know, on my own, like I graduated college and I was like living in my own townhouse and making money. And then I was like, selling the townhouse, like moving in with my parents, like being the kid that lives like in their basement. And, you know, then you became people. a poor student. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I became a student. Um, it was, it was definitely, you know, a downgrade from my previous lifestyle, but it was so worth it in the end to, to do what I, I really wanted to do. And um, so I, I love actually, I love meeting other students or other people that have are non-traditional vet students, because I just love their stories. I think it's so interesting. And I think it's a really great example of how you might not always know what you want to do, or that might change as you get older. And, and that's completely okay to evolve. I think, you know? Um, yeah. You know, and there's a lot more yeah. of them than I ever realized. Yeah. You know, yeah. in my veterinary class, we had some older students that were, you know, second career, but as I do this more and more, and I meet more and more veterinarians and I have more and more people on the podcast, a lot of them 
like military and other careers. And, you know, even one of my veterinarians that I hired had been a business person like you and had gone back. And so, yeah, I, I, I think that that's a really good thing to put out there because some people that aren't vets or always want to be a vet, they can still do it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I actually wasn't mature enough to pursue like a vet, a pre-vet, um, curriculum when I first went to college I just you have to really be intense and like really want to do it really know that you're going to do it and disciplined at that time and I was just not age 18 19 20 21 discipline was like not my thing <laughs> like I, it was just you know you were a partier huh that's yeah I like to I like to go out in the evenings Julia, go out and play have a good time so yeah so um uh, that was definitely not my thing at that time and so it's okay to if you're you know if you're a late bloomer I used to feel shame around that like you know, maybe the kids that had it all together all when they were 18 and 19, like, you know, that they, I felt shame about not being one of them originally. Um, but as I got older, I just realized that everyone has different paths and my path was just different. And I'm, I'm thankful for the path that I had, because I think it's what's enabled me to be successful in other areas now in my current situation. Um, and as a veterinarian today. Yeah. So once you got out of vet school, did you go right into private practice or where did that take you? Yeah. So I went to Virginia Tech. um, And when I graduated, I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, and I started in small animal private practice right away. Um, I didn't want to do an internship. I just wanted to start making money and paying off loans (laughs) was what I wanted to do. I was like, yeah, that's great. Valid, right? Internship. (laughs) Like, I want to start making money. So I took um, an internship or sorry, I took a a job at a small animal practice and started working and started just kind of learning what vet medicine was all about when you're actually out in practice, which is very, very different than vet school. And um, I worked at several places in Charlotte had very different experiences at all of them and finally ended up at a clinic that I loved um, probably about, uh, it was maybe four years after vet school or three years after vet school. And um, definitely learned a lot about vet medicine that I I really, I I don't wanna say I wasn't aware of it. I just don't think that I was as tuned into it because I was so focused on getting into vet school and, you know, studying and learning. And then I was like, I'll deal with all the other stuff that they talk about when I get out and try to navigate that then, so. But um, one of the reasons why I started, co-founded Vets on the Rise with my classmate, Ashley Gray, was our experience being new veterinarians was very daunting. And it was a lot more difficult than I think people give you, give you, give them credit for new vets that are going through it. So we just found that I think we always knew that it was going to be hard that, that first year out. But we didn't really notice, we didn't really know how like isolating and how difficult it really would be for us until we got there. And we were like, wow, people don't really talk about this enough. Like they don't talk about the challenges that new vets face enough or really how hard those first two or three years can be for for vets when they first graduate. Yeah. And how much you don't know. Yeah, exactly. They they push you out of school and you're supposed to know everything, but yeah. Like I worked for a lot of years for a veterinarian. Luckily, she was a great mentor to me. And so all through vet school, I worked for her and I learned a lot of practical stuff like on the ground. I learned how to, you know, clean ears and do fecals. And like I learned a lot of that stuff that they really don't teach you in school. And I think had I not had that experience working for her, I would have had even a harder time getting out because it's kind of like, you know, one minute, you know, nothing and you're a student and the next minute they expect you to be the doctor. And there's a huge like imposter yeah. syndrome that comes with that. Don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's a huge difference. I mean, there's a huge difference between being book smart and getting through vet school and passing those tests versus applying the knowledge that you have or dealing with just the real life circumstances that come up, you know, someone that doesn't have the finances to, to pursue something. Well, how do you augment your plan or talk to them in a way where they're going to understand what the real options really are, what they really should do or when they need to stop, you know, or yeah. when they need to stop. And so um, there's a lot of things that you're really not, you're not taught and you don't really learn until you kind of go through it. And if you don't have good mentorship during that time or a vet, like you were talking about, like teaching you just like basic stuff, you're really, really going to struggle. So uh, I know that when I graduated, one of my my biggest um, things I seeked that I seeked in my first job was to find a place that had good mentorship. And I, I had okay mentorship. 
<laughs> my first job. Um, I think that there's a lot of ideas of what mentorship should look like, but, and they, I think they differ wildly between vet students and between some of the mentors that are out there. Although there's, there are plenty of places that have amazing mentorship, but there's plenty that, that say they're going to offer it and then maybe don't have the best. Um, but you know, you always have to just make the best with whatever situation you're in and you can always kind of accommodate for that. But that was one of the reasons why Ashley and I, Ashley had a different situation where, um, uh, Ashley, my business partner in Vets on the Rise, where she took an internship in Charlotte and she had kind of an opposite situation where she was immediately exposed to not necessarily corporate medicine, but it was like burned out doctors, you know, all of a sudden they're asking them to take emergency shifts solo at night. Um, and instead of the, having the mentorship, they had promised they'd have overnight. So there's, there's only three of them in the program at that time. Like it was just like, a you know, so they don't know how much they can advocate for themselves and whatnot. Kind of so like just threw them in and expected them yeah. to figure it out. Yeah. And then like chronically short staffed, you know, con constant staff turnover. So you really don't have the help that you need during the day. Just a lot of the the things that can happen at, at vet practices. So she dealt with a lot of that. In addition to the, the challenges you have as being, in, of being a new vet, the lack of confidence you have, you're not knowing what you're, you know, feeling like you don't know what you're doing, even though I think you do know a lot more. Trying to put on a brave face in front yeah. of the clients when you figure yeah, they know more than you. I used to hate when like breeders or somebody would come in because automatically you're like, Oh, they know way more about the species than, you know, this cat mm -hmm. breed than I do, or they know more about these dogs than I do. And you get kind of like, you know, you forget how smart you really are and what you really know. You do. Absolutely. You do. Um, and I always tell, tell me about some, like you guys know way more than you give yourself credit for. It's just the application of it and just learning. There is this really practical aspect of veterinary medicine that is the difference between helping cases go smoothly, you know, knowing cases are going to go as smooth as they can. People are all different. There's the different right. levels of um, clients that you deal with, but certainly there is a real practical aspect that can be super valuable. So we um, sought to, to start bringing awareness to that with Vets on the Rise. That was kind of one of our big missions was, okay, like we've got to figure out how to help new veterinarians because there are so many, new, you know, thousands of new veterinarians out there every single year, probably literally going through our exact same issues that we're going through and, um, and they may not have mentorship. They may not know how to advocate for themselves. They may be struggling with how to handle these cases. So Ashley and I decided that the first thing we were going to do was actually just to write a book with like our client communication tips and our approach to these certain cases That's and awesome. things that we, yeah. And like mistakes that we made with those cases so that they knew because we are like these mistakes people are going to make. And we, um, we ended up so after I worked at my first job for a year, I left and went to Ashley's hospital, which was a 24 hour hospital where they had internship classes. And so we would, we spent several years mentoring internship classes after, after that. And every single year, the, the new vets just come out and they face the exact same challenges that we had when we had graduated. It was just like groundhog day. We were like, there's, <laughs> there's something missing in our education. If like these smart, talented new vets come out and they keep making the exact same mistakes that every class before them had made. And that was really when we were like, Hey, let's do this. So we wrote, yeah. um, we wrote two books that take, uh, new vets through 20 cases. So our first book is one that goes through general practice cases. It's called new vet jumpstart guide. And it takes you through 20 common GP cases that you'll see our approach, literal client communication tips, literal treatments that we, we would offer to these clients, um, literal mistakes that we've made, or we saw other vets made so that you kind of knew what they were and knew what to look out for. And any tip we can think of in there, we wanted to be like, you know, like if that new vet was working with us in the clinic, these are the things that we would tell you like that. If you don't have a mentor at your place, like we will be a mentor for you through our book. Right. And so, um, we did that, uh, in 20, 2020, we published the general practice book. Or is it 2021? I think it was sorry, 2020, 2021, we published the general practice book with 20 cases. And then just this year, two months ago, we published the ER version where we go through ER cases, 20 of them and do the same thing. Only in this version, we have um, nine or 10 other veterinarians that are helping us in this book and that are giving their insight on ER cases. We've got specialists in there that are helping us. And it's just a really, it's a really exciting, exciting book that we we're, we're super thrilled to have out right now for. Yeah. I think that would be use, so useful for so many people because you yeah. do like, I I've been in vet med long enough that I've mentored a lot of new veterinarians and even through, you know, the MVMA. And they do, almost all of them have the same issues. Oh yeah. You know, yeah like they don't know how to talk to clients or if clients start getting aggressive, 
Um, one of my biggest ones with young vets is they don't want to say, I don't know. Right. And that, that is like, oh no, you have to say, I don't know. Like that is part of your language (laughs) because if you always pretend like, you know, and you don't, you, you're going to get yourself into big trouble. Absolutely. Yeah, I Um, know. And I think, I think when you are in fourth year of vet school, it's just, you're constantly told that you need to have the answer, right? Like it's, mm -hmm. they've got this. They teach it wrong. wrong. I don't know what these colleges do, but they don't teach it right. (laughs) Right. And so you get out and you're like, oh my God, if I don't, if I don't have the definitive answer on this case, then I'm, I'm not, I'm not a good vet. But most of the time you have, you've ruled out a lot of things, but you, you only have a big idea. You have an idea of what it could be, but you're not, you know, it's not definitive or oftentimes it's, it can be like that in veterinary medicine. Yeah. And almost, finding- almost half your cases a day. You're kind of like, well, I yeah. think it's this, I hope it's this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. try this. <laughs> exactly. And what I happens. think like finding that comfort in, I don't know, takes a really long time. And, and I don't, I don't know if you ever, you ever get completely comfortable comfortable with it. Like, you know, with imposter syndrome, you know, it never goes away. We talk about it never really goes away. You just learn how to manage it better. But also with like the, I don't know, I think you just become more comfortable seeing it and realizing that it doesn't mean you don't know because you're, you're a bad vet. That's not what it's saying. And that's, I think what a a lot of people feel like it's that they're saying when they say that, but that's not true at all. The best vets I know say, I say, have to say it. Right. And, oh, all the time. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and if you can get good at saying, I don't know. Yeah. You'll absolutely. be confident. It's like, look, I'm not sure exactly what's going on here, but I want to run blood work. I want to do some x-rays, you right. know, and maybe we'll find out. Right. I think, I think the mistake we make is, is pretending like we will know. Always. Right. And it's yeah. just like, if you've ever been to the hospital or you've ever been to a human doctor, you know, that most of the time they don't know either. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like we're doing our best to find it out. And that's yeah. what we're trying to guide you to. Right. Yeah. I, ha- and- I had a heart doctor say to me once, he goes, I don't know what's wrong with you, but it's not your heart. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I was like, cool. On to the next doctor. <laughs> well, rule that out. Yeah. Let's move on. Which is nice, yeah. but you don't want to think you have a heart problem, but it was just funny the way he said it. Yeah. It's like, see, he doesn't know. And he's a heart specialist for people. <laughs> right. Right. I know. I think like finding comfort that can be really difficult and all the other things they have to deal with, you know, you make it, like, I always talk about vet medicine. I think vet medicine kind of just accelerates the lessons of life. Right. Mm. Like, so for other people that go out and they start a job, you know, in corporate world or whatever, um, they'll certainly learn lessons as they go through their life. But in vet medicine, you're going to be dealing with life and death and you're going to actually have an accelerated learning of the lessons of life. That's a really um, interesting way to look at it. Yeah. Well, cause I, th- I think you, you stumble, you know, every stumble that you have may have an implication, right? And so it's just that much harder on yourself when you make those stumbles. If you actually send an email out to the wrong person in corporate medicine, it's not, you don't have to answer to the client, right? Or you don't have right. to answer. Right. So you're just, it's, you're, it's just a colleague and not, it's just not like, a, not a public. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, and you probably didn't have four years of training directly on, you know, not sending that email out. So it's a lot less <laughs> intense for you, but when you're, when you're in vet med, I always think about these people that are coming out, you just, it's just life's lessons accelerated, which is why the tough parts, which you're dealing a lot with during your first year out, especially the tough parts are even that much tougher because you're just constantly kind of getting knocked down by those waves and trying to get back up. Um, more so than anyone, any of your peers that are in other, other careers, non-medical careers, I think. So, um, I just think that that just goes to show, you know, how, how, how resilient veterinarians and, and vet staff are and, um, and how amazing they really are to be in this profession, doing what they're doing out there and putting on, you know, going out there every day and, and trying to help animals and trying to do, to do the best they can for this world. Yeah. So what's your, like, big, I I guess maybe one or two big pieces of advice for someone that's brand new. Like I just graduated, I'm going to my new job. What should I do? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. So I I think your book, (laughs) I mean, our books will definitely be invaluable to help because we give like our formulas for how we can succeed through those cases. Um, But I think one of the first things to try to do is to try to find like that support structure. So you have to have a mentor. If you don't have one at your clinic, then you should reach out and try to find a place that you can have that. 
there are mentorship companies. Um, Ashley and I even offered it for a short period of time. We're open to it at times when we can fit it in. Um, but try to find a group of people you can bounce ideas off of, whether it's three or four of your classmates that you just have a group text going back and forth with and you can bounce ideas off of, whether it's a mentor that you can have at work. Um, so try to find that support structure where you've got places to go, whether you're calling, you know, Antec or IDEX to consult on blood work to learn with their specialists to consult on your cases. Yeah. Yeah. But I told it's my there. latest young vet, I'm like, call IDEX. They're always so helpful. Yeah. When I yeah, call them. So, and they don't make you feel stupid. Right. And I, I mean, I, I use them to this day, like every oh, I day, always do. right? Like yeah. all the time. Like, I don't know. What, I don't know what to do with this dog. I'm going to call them. Yeah. They, they really will. They'll tell you what the next test is. They'll tell you how to interpret the blood work. I mean, I don't know what they taught us in vet school, but I don't remember really learning how to interpret blood work very well. Like you yeah. kind of know what BUN means. You kind of know, but when you <laughs> put complicated CBC or, you know, like right. a weird picture, you don't, coming out of vet school, you don't know. Yeah. There's definitely a lot that goes into it. There, there really is. And that's, it's so funny you said that because, and I'll elaborate on this later. One of the, one of the um, hours of CE that we have in our senior dog, senior dog vet um, course that we have coming out in May is about interpreting lab work and geriatrics, because a lot of people say they're like, gosh, like, what do I even do when we have these elevations and these, do I care? <laughs> do I not care? High ASD, like, the high ALT, yeah. the high BUN, you got all this stuff going on in your right. life. Is it just an old dog or does this mean something or can I do anything about right. it? Yeah. And I don't even know how many veterinarians actually think that like the ALK boss range needs to be like the high, the high, oh. what's considered high needs to be like up 200 points, right? It needs yeah. to be like anything above Way more than that. Yeah. <laughs> it needs to be <laughs> but they're always elevated. high. Right. Exactly. And so it's always high. And we're always trying to diagnose Cushing's and it's not Cushing. Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I have to try to explain Alphas. We have a funny meme about this where we're trying to explain what like just an like perfect blood work, but like just an elevated Alphas means to a, a client. We're like, yeah. So it's like this value that's like, you know, related to <laughs> liver induction. It could be something, but it could be nothing. And it's probably nothing. And it's could like, be you know, stress could be muscle, yeah. <laughs> could be heart, could be liver. Yeah. And, just, and clients get really disturbed by it. Right. Yeah. And they're like, well, they're why like, is it like, it's high. Uh, yeah. Why is this a hundred points? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All so, so anyways, um, yeah, that's, that's that. Yeah. So that's one of the tips I have for veterinarians is to try to find those like little easy, um, so those support system that you can have to, to bounce ideas off of cases um, with people. Certainly a mentor is really important. And then I think when you have a mentor, I think one of the mistakes that sometimes new vets do is um, they will be asking them, they'll be asking their mentor questions like at all times throughout the day, which is fine oftentimes to start, but it can be super helpful if you have a mentor, if you can set aside a time where maybe they're not in between two or three cases to ask them that. Cause I've, I've actually seen it. Like I, I've seen it where new vets come out and I'm watching them ask, you know, a colleague of mine, a question, and I'm working on a case and I can see my colleague getting frustrated with the the fact that this new vet sits next and I to ask them stuff all throughout the day. At first I'm like, well, why are you getting frustrated? Like she, this person needs to be asking you questions. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then when I talk to my colleague, like, well, it's not, it's not that it's just that it, it would be, it would be better. Sometimes they don't have the signalment when they come to me. So I have to be like, well, what was the signalment? You know, and I have right. to ask questions. So like, when you're going to go ask the question, come with your signalment, do think about the timing of it. If it's an emergency, always, you can always interrupt. I think someone and ask, like, I'm always dropping everything I'm going to do to go help that person, right. um, whether it's a new vet or not. But I do think trying to think about how, about when you approach them, always having a signalment, maybe asking them if there's a certain time where you could bounce like two or three cases off of them, if they're not emergent um, or if they're not in there at that moment. Um, and, and approaching it that way can be super helpful for them as well. Just some tips for keeping those relationships good for the long term. Yeah. Because usually what, what happens is when they first start off, it's not a big deal when they're asking a question for every case. It really isn't. But then I think when you start watching it six months down the road, I start seeing a little bit of a strain happening. And I'm like, well, why? Why is that strain there? And it's like, well, it's just, you know, this isn't there. And I think that um, keeping that in mind can be really helpful for prolonging that mentorship. Uh, and just setting around aside some like little boundaries could be so certain. Yeah. Important. And the opposite problem you'll make if you don't use your mentors, if you don't double check and triple check mm -hmm. is you'll miss stuff. Like I, I've had veterinarians where they'll run rads on a dog and it's super obvious to me what's wrong, 
but because they're new, they, they miss it. Like they miss this yeah. tumor or something, you know, they took an abdominal yeah. ad and I'm like, holy cow, there's a huge tumor there. And they don't see it because they're not used to looking at that. And they failed to ask me, you know, right. to, to double check these x-rays for them, or they, they failed to send them out to a specialist or, right. you know, and then it's too late. Like when the dog got splenic mass or, you know, whatever. And I, and I've had that happen with some of my new vets and I'm like, oh, if you would have just showed me those x-rays, I would have saved right. you, you know, right. I saved you so much heartache because I, you know, I, I know what, when I was young, a young vet, I used to always bring my chest rads to my mentor because I couldn't read those to save my life. Like I, yeah, it's so hard to read. And so I, I would always go to Dr. Mullen, who was one of my mentors when I started at Warren Woods and I would, he was great at chess. And I was like, is this heart disease or lung disease? I don't know. Right. And right. he was always super helpful, you know, but I think that that imposter syndrome makes us not want to ask. I agree. And I think we're embarrassed, you know, like, oh, do I have to ask on every case? And you don't I know, have to, but, but you do want to make sure that, you know, you're using them to your fullest capacity. Absolutely. And I, I think that brings up a really good point. Um, and, you know, the question is like, well, what, why are you fearful to ask? And maybe it's kind of what I, what I just mentioned. I think, I think a lot of new vets are actually fearful to ask. And I think that yeah. it would be helpful if the mentoring vet could be like, Hey, you can ask me anytime, but if it's a case that's not here, it doesn't need to be asked. Or can you, you know, whatever that boundary is that you have, if you're being, if you're a mentor, just let them know it so that you can, you guys, you can be helpful to them when they need it. Yeah, or give them a 30 minutes going. of your time every day or give them an hour yeah. of time every day. Like let's meet at lunch every day and go over your cases if if you Absolutely. want to kind of thing. Absolutely. And I think that brings up another point that I, I feel really passionate about in vet med that I don't, I don't think a lot of clinics do, but I think some do, but is this idea of like collaborative medicine. Mm. I really think patients benefit greatly if you have a doctor team that can communicate with each other and can bounce ideas off of each other you just have to have it like it's mm -hmm. you certainly can be a doctor and be solo by yourself and just consult on yourself or consult with that one person every now and then when you have a question and you can you can practice like that you can do fine with like that but i really do think that patients benefit and doctor teams really build and become extremely strong doctor teams if you can have a team that can be open to collaborating back and forth on cases discussing the x-rays with one another and what they see and what they don't, not rolling your eyes when you're being called to look at another x-ray, you know, which does happen, unfortunately, in some cases. My last practice that I worked at, um, where I was veterinarian for five years there, I was chief of staff and head doctor for the last two years, I believe. Um, but we had the most amazing doctor team. And that was a really big, important part of like a tenant for us was like, we need to be able to consult with each other in all these cases and bounce ideas off of it. And it became this thing where, yeah, I could be tough, finishing up a record real quick. But if someone comes and asks me to look at an x-ray, I'm, I usually just, just stop it and go up and look at it with them real quick. Cause they're not asking me unless they really do want some insight on it. But I do think this idea of helping one another more and, and instead of judging people sometimes, which I see in some clinics, I think it's because people are burned out. I think they're stressed. I think maybe someone treated them like that. And they think that's how you're supposed to. That's okay. Like, yeah. Yeah. I really think that stepping up and, and looking to work like that as a doctor team can be really, really powerful for our patients and for our mental health as a team. Um, you know, knowing when you go to sleep at night that you at least had asked another doctor about that case you're kind of thought you had, but you weren't quite sure you're going to sleep a little bit better that night before you go to work um, the next day. I think that stuff really matters and can have a huge impact. In that yeah. Medicine. Yeah. I worked a lot of years with a friend of mine who is one of those veterinarians, which I am not, she like remembers all the zebras. Like she's super smart, like scary smart. And the two of us were a good team because she'd always be like looking for all these zebra diseases. And then she'd bring it to me and I'd be like, well, it could just be a bladder infection. <laughs> you know, like I would pull her back down to earth. And then when right. I was struggling, she was like, well, what about this? What about this? You should do this. You know, like she'd have all these ideas and I'd be like, Oh, like I wouldn't have thought of that in a million years because that's not yeah. how my brain works. I'm very like logical, but not very like 
I don't remember all the, the really weird things that, you know, and, yeah. and she'd always be like, oh, I just read this article and she'd pull it yeah. up, you know, like <laughs> that's just how her brain worked. But it was such a great collaboration because whenever there was something, you know, I remember one time I was trying to look at a retina on a cat's eye and I was back in the treatment room looking at it with my lens. And I said, yeah, I think this cat might have a detached retina. And she literally like slid like Tom Cruise <laughs> and she bumped, like hip bumped me, hip checked me out of the front of the cat. And then she just started looking at the eye. Like she was so excited. And I was yeah. like, you literally just hip checked me about this cat. And, but it was yeah. a really fun, like working relationship. Yeah. because it was like, you know, when she had trouble in surgery, she'd call me and I'd be the calm one when I was having trouble in surgery and I was freaking out, then she'd come in and be the calm one. And I think Absolutely. if you can have somebody like that, it, it's so valuable. Oh yeah. I, I, I totally agree. And it, and it makes work. It makes, sorry, that's my old Chinese crested dog demanding. <laughs> I throw his ball. Um, that's what they were talking about senior dogs today. Yeah. That's right. They're all invited. <laughs> So, but yeah, I mean, and it makes work a, a happier place to be and a happier place to, to go. And so I always, I always think it's important to ask yourself as a veterinarian, um, you know, am I, am I being a good, am I being a good like team player for my fellow vets? Like, am I someone that they, they feel they can approach? Am I someone that is there to, you know, will drop what I'm doing to go help them? You know, am I, am I someone that can do that as well to help them out? And I think that, um, I think that's really important um, for creating happier work environments. For Yeah. And for, humbling for yourselves other. to be okay with not being right. Like if you yeah. ask someone and they say, oh, it's, oh, didn't you see that? Like, look at that. big right. Did you miss that? And I'd be like, oh yeah, I guess I did. <laughs> but being okay with that and being like, oh, yeah. thing I asked you, you know, cause I didn't see that or whatever, right. you know, right. Or, or, <laughs> no. or they might say, do you think that's a tumor? And I'd be like, no, it's not a tumor. And then, you know, ha just having the discussion. I think right. okay with like being wrong, you know, I think, yeah. And, and I think learning some tact too. Right. I mean, like, cause <laughs> like having a little bit of tact when you approach it, you're like, Oh, I don't see that, but did you see this? You know, there's, there is a way that you, collaboration is a lot more fun if we're dropping our egos, of course. And if we're keeping in mind, you know, tact and approach, how we, how we going to be approaching people to help make it make a, a really tough job, you know, a little bit, a little bit lighter. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I that reminded me, I remember this, this, one of the, one of the vets that I knew, she's a very, very good vet, but she was telling me the story. I'd made a mistake on a case and she was telling me this story. She's like, Monica, I walked in one day and I looked at an x-ray of a chest and there were two hearts in there. And I was like, are there really two hearts in this chest? <laughs> you know? and then I was like, no, that can't be. But she's like, but my brain told me for the first three seconds, there may have been two hearts. It's like, what? <laughs> but there was it's a big mass. Yeah, there were, yeah, there was a mass in there, but she was like, I completely like, <laughs> my brain didn't register it right away. And she was mm -hmm. like, so don't, don't be upset about your mistake. And I was like, okay, you know, so um, yeah, there, we just having a little bit of, of grace and um, acceptance and uh, for one another, I think can be super helpful. Yeah, so, I love that. Well, let's talk about that was Vets on the Rise and the Young Veterinarians and all the information you have for them. So I, yeah. I would encourage people to reach out to you um, if they have, if they're new and they have questions and they want to get your book. Let's talk about the seniors. Yeah. So senior how did you get into dogs. that? Yeah. So I, the, the, really the, re the reason I got into um, really catering to senior and geriatric dogs is because of my soul dog. I had a, a Westie named Frodo. Frodo Baggins Tarantino, and <laughs> he was like my ride or die. We traveled around the country together. He was with me when I switched careers, went to vet school with me, um, saw me living, you know, in, in my parents' basement that stage, you know, all, all of the things with me. So he was, he was there with me for everything. And he was a really healthy dog up until about age 10. And at age 10, it was like all the classic aging diseases started popping up. So he started developing a cough and he developed chronic bronchitis. He had um, started having neck pain flare-ups where he wouldn't want to move, you know, um, and that would happen once or twice a year. It was really scary for, for us. Didn't require surgery, but started having that, started having a collapsing trachea, developed a heart murmur, had a mass that we had to do surgery on and have it removed. Like all these different things, <laughs> arthritis developing, like literally for his last four or five years, um, he started having a lot of different things going on. And I remember 
remember um, I was in this process where I had been working at an animal hospital and was applying to vet school and going in and starting vet school. So I was at this place where you really don't know a lot when you're at that stage. You don't really know. <laughs> you might much think all, you right? do. <laughs> you might think you do, but you you probably just don't. Um, and so I was at this stage where I I'm starting to learn about, about, about everything that I wanted to learn. And then my, my little dog next to me that, um, keeps like breaking down every few months and having something new that comes up. And I remember just going through that process and I felt like, I felt like no one quite prepared me for what senior and geriatric stage of life can be like, like I, in, in my brain, I knew, well, he's getting older. Sure. More things could happen, but no one actually ever said that to me. Right. And no one actually really talked to me about what it's like, the the different things that you need to be focusing on for these older pets as they get older. Um, and so I remember feeling lost after that whole experience. I I, I, I didn't lose Frodo. So I graduated. And then about two years um, after I graduated is when I lost him. So I went through a whole process. But I remember feeling completely lost to that whole stage. And then um, watching patients, older patients come in and thinking, God, like there's so much more that we could be doing for these guys and that we should be talking to pet parents about as they go through the stage with them. A lot of people, unless you've you know, actually cared for an elderly grandparent until they've passed or someone in your family until they've passed, like in their, their end of life, you, you don't really, you're not really exposed to that. And I certainly hadn't been exposed to that um, until closer to the end of his life. So, so that was a, that was, he was kind of my why was, I was like, there's a lot that we can be doing differently with, with senior dog pet parents. And that group of pet parents, they have, they have a lot on their plates they're watching their best friend get older and they know they're going to lose them. They're going through anticipatory grief. Oftentimes they don't even know they're going through it. Um, and they're dealing with some complex, just some, some tough choices for them. Do I do this procedure? Do I not? Do I, you know, um, is it okay for me to do the, a dental on him this year? Is it not? There's a lot of things that they're, they're grasping as they're trying to squeeze out, you know, the, the, the last lives out of their, their, their pets and cherish them as much as possible, but they're, they're terrified of losing them. So, um, that was really what inspired me to, to do it. And then I, you know, when I went back and I thought about it even more, the truth is that when we were in vet school, we had, I mean, how many classes did you have on geriatric medicine or I don't think none? any, I don't remember none having any. Yeah, yeah. We had none either. So we had zero classes on it. And yet these are the most complex patients that we have. Well, right? and there's and so many of them. Exactly. And now yeah. the latest data suggests that they make up at least 52% of our population, right. That we're seeing. So half the, and half the dogs that you see are old are older. Mm -hmm. So, um, that was kind of the thing too. I was like, God, and and part of that is not really, you know, our vet school's fault necessarily like geriatric medicine in and of itself, extremely young. Um, even in human medicine, it's young. It's, it's very more, it's younger in vet medicine, of course, because we're kind of following them, but there's a lot that we have to learn, but there's a lot of cool stuff going on that now where we're starting to get more and more data about older dogs and starting to learn about that. So because of that, um, you know, originally I, I formed, I formed senior dog revolution, which is kind of more pet parent focused to help them talk about their geriatrics and senior dogs and what to expect. But then after a few years, I decided that I wanted to make something for veterinarians that we had a more cohesive place where we have evidence-based medicine for senior and geriatric dogs that any DVM can come and learn about and, um, and enhance their knowledge and enhance their, their tools and hopefully have better ways to approach their senior, senior geriatric patients, which I know they care deeply about. We just haven't had that, that guidance around. So I formed that with, um, Dr. Lauren Adelman, who is a internal medicine specialist based out of Canada. And then also Dr. Lisa Littman, who's another um, general practitioner who I love um, dearly. And so the three of us formed that just this past year. And the really exciting thing that we have coming out is we have some CE coming out with some amazing um, lessons on senior geriatric medicine, uh, and it will be available this May, May 2023. So I think it's May 13th it becomes available to take. It's all online, so you can just take it at home anytime in your pajamas um, for uh, the next year. You know, <laughs> I like and, that. Yeah, <laughs> when I have to show up senior, in class. <laughs> exactly. And you can learn about senior and geriatric dog medicine, and we'll keep having more CE coming out. But we're really trying to be the um, place that veterinarians can go to help, um, to learn how to help their senior geriatric patients. Yeah. Well. I think it's such a complex thing because when you're talking to someone with a geriatric pet, it's, you really have to have the communication skills to deal with what they're dealing with. Like I, I can yeah. remember vividly 
this woman was just suffering because her dog was old and he was so, you know, he had such bad dementia that all he did was poop and circle and bark like all night long and right. she didn't sleep and she felt so guilty, but he was still eating. So should I put him to sleep? You know, like just having those kind of tools in your toolbox to be like, okay, here's some things we can do medically if you want to keep him going, but here's also some things we can counsel you through because, you know, my, my line or my opinion was always like, well, I don't want you to keep this dog just because you can, right. if you're both suffering, like if you're suffering right. miserably and he's suffering, what are we doing? You know, like right. we have some options. So I think that's just, it's a really tough place to be in because there's so many levels of that, right? Like my dog Trent's 11 going on 12 and he just this year got a little slower on his walks and he doesn't hear as well. So sometimes he sleeps, you know, more than he should. And just getting to that, like, oh, he's not the same dog he was two years ago and yeah. kind of dealing with that, you know, and then the patience it takes because oh, yeah. when you take him out, if he doesn't want to go that way, he's not going that way. He just right. stands until I go, you want to go this way? And then he's like, yep, we're going that way. Yeah. But you know, he's just gotten a little stubborn as he's gotten yeah. older. So yeah, it's, it's fascinating. It really, it really is. And I think you, you highlighted a couple really important things, like the feelings that that pet parent that you worked with had like this intense feeling of guilt. guilt. She probably mm -hmm. gave everything she ever possibly had to that dog. Right. And yet, and I, and I do think, I do think that doggy dementia, um, CCD, I think that that is one of the difficult diseases to make that decision for. Yeah. Because they're, is. they're doing what you're talking about. They're slow they're walking still around eating. eating like, yeah, yeah. they still like seem zombie. okay. <laughs> Even yeah. Yeah. We kind of become like a zombie version of who they were and you're, you know, there's a, there's a lot of caretaker exhaustion that goes into it. So there's just a lot that we can be doing. And I think that that's, um, our doing out there and that if we can figure out ways to even make it more cohesive and better that we're going to be benefiting one one another and helping our yeah, patients absolutely. out even better. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm really glad you're another, doing me, me too. We're, we're really excited about it. We've got some really cool stuff coming down, um, um, coming down the pipeline too. So canine frailty, for example, is a topic. Well, so frailty is a topic that um, is very popular in human medicine and human geriatric medicine. But for veterinarians and vet med, we hardly use, we hardly talk about it, but it can be really important with um, predicting, you know, length of lifespan and whatnot and, and, and kind of assessing what's going on at home with, with pets. And so we're really working on trying to figure out ways to help veterinarians incorporate that assessment into their practice, their daily practice more. And we've got some exciting stuff coming out. I can't quite talk about it yet. Um, we've got some exciting stuff coming out uh, that it's hopefully I'll share. Criteria. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not, it's just like, it's in the works. And I'm like, if I don't, I can't tell you guys now, but I want important. to, yeah, yeah, but I, I deeply want to, but I, I can't. Well, I think just being um, aware that you're working on it is, is really good because I don't, I don't think anyone else is doing this kind of work. Are they, are there other geriatric people working in this, this part of the, of vet med? seems like there, I started talking to you is the first time I heard about it. Yeah. So there's a, there's a couple um people that are doing some really great things out there. Um, Dr. Brennan McKenzie, he is a veterinarian that works for Loyal, a company, and he is, uh, I think, honestly, he's kind of one of the pioneers, I feel like, in geriatric uh, veterinary medicine, and he has some really great talks out there that he does on the topic. Dr. Mary Gardner, obviously, um, from Lap of Love, is has been a huge champion of, and proponent of geriatrics for a really long time. I'm, I'm definitely, um, definitely a fan of, of hers, and, and she's kind of a role model to me, and and then finally, you know, AHA finally came out with some senior dog guidelines this year, just like a month ago, which are yeah, brand new. And, yeah, and to be that. honest, up until that point, you know, all we really had was like, yeah, you can start screening their blood work every six months <laughs> or, or start having them come in <laughs> Check yeah, them for up the every ones. Six months. Yeah, yeah. Start checking them every six months and maybe start doing blood work more frequently. You're like, that's great, but that doesn't quite cover it for <laughs> the senior no. geriatrics. No, so they've got guidelines. So many other things. Yeah. So they've got some guidelines, which are, I think are, are really great um, and a great start. And so um, that's, that's really cool. And we're, we're going to be coming out with some other cool stuff too, for, to really help practitioners as well. So just great. a lot, it's a lot coming down. Yeah. Yeah. Really exciting. So tell me before we get done here, tell me about being an entrepreneur. 
Cause that, oh my I mean, God. the fact that you have an MBA, I understand how you went that way. But if there's other people out there that think they want to be an entrepreneur, you know, if they have that kind of spirit, talk a little bit about that. Like what yeah. inspired you to do all these businesses you've got going? I mean, it, for, for me, it was the need when it first, you know, when I first started it, because for, I, I, I struggled when I had Frodo with trying to make those choices for him as a senior dog pet parent, even with a medical degree, I struggled with it. And I was like, it's God. different, right? When it's your yeah. own, yeah, there's yeah, different emotions I'm, involved. Absolutely. And so I thought, well, I want to create this resource for pet parents that, that they can use. Cause no one's talking about it. You could Google it. And there just wasn't anything about senior dogs out there. So that's why I started senior dog revolution, the podcast and the blog and then my, my social media. Um, so that was one of the reasons really why I did it. And then the same thing for, for the veterinarians. Like I told you, Ashley and I, we worked at that 24 hour hospital, um, for vets in the rise. We worked at 24 hour hospital and we kept seeing these new intern classes coming in and literally making the same mistakes that we made year after year after year. And these are smart, smart people, the smartest in the country, right? Yeah, it's coming stuff in and doing that they this. don't teach you in vet school. And we were like, yeah. yeah, there's a huge disconnect. If, if smart, smart people are coming out making the same mistakes. Yeah. With what they're vet school is missing something. So we wanted right. to try to help fill that gap, Bridget, um, yeah. which the books was the easiest way. Cause we're like, well, we can't mentor every single new vet out there. It's just right. literally impossible for us to do that. So what's, what's another way that I could be like, Hey, for that case, you want to use this, or you want to say that because otherwise you're going to be in trouble. You know, how can I get that information to them? And the best way was right. these books was to write these books. So we, we spent a lot of time writing those books and we're so proud and so thrilled with how they came out and the vets, the new vets that have them, like they're, they love them, which means, you know, makes us feel so happy that we're helping them. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, so being an entrepreneur, it really just started off with the need, seeing the need for it and wanting to, to help. Um, but the truth is that when you're an entrepreneur, you have to, you have to make money, right? You have to like, like you have That's to, the hardest to... Part. you can do all the work, yeah. but if it doesn't you bring do you any money, work. you're like, wait a minute. Yeah. So I think that's the most fun part it, it, or one of the really fun parts is like, it's like, okay, well, we know there's this need, but like, how can I meet that need for vets in the rise? It was exactly what I told you. We can't talk to every single vet out there. We literally wouldn't have the time to mentor them if we wanted mm -hmm. to. So what can we do? So it was books. Books are easily accessible. You have them at the clinic. You can bring them out. They're so, so easy. Um, and then with the senior dog, um, the senior dog stuff, I have a course for pet parents that they can take online at any time that they want. And then for senior dog vets, which is the most, you know, honestly, the thing, probably the thing that I'm so excited about. And because I, I know how excited veterinarians are about their senior and geriatric patients. And I know how badly they've probably been waiting for something like this. Um, but the CE is going to be the way to really do that and continue to try to move senior and geriatric me um, medicine forward in our clinics in a practical way right? Because when you think about it right now, there's, I don't know, like 20 different scales you could use, or you're supposed to be using with senior and geriatric dogs. Like, how do you make that work in an appointment? Right? right. How do you do that without overwhelming a pet parent who's worried about their dog? Like, Hey, like, why don't you fill out this, like this 13 question questionnaire, this 20 question questionnaire, and this other one, they're just going to like, take this out. home and watch them. Yeah. Weeks and, yeah. Yeah. That's and then I'm going to happen. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you about chronic pain for 10 minutes. Like, it's like just Doc, can you just keep her from leaking urine? That's all I care. Right. About. You know, like at this like point, what, yeah. my dog's leaking. Can you fix yeah, it? That's all they exactly. care about. So I think really trying to problem solve is just the best way to get into being an entrepreneur and then talking and reaching out to people um, about it. But um, those are, those are really important for it. Um, certainly what not an easy that, path. What, yeah. What do you think the personality trait is it makes? Cause I've always kind of been entrepreneurial, you know, like I wanted yeah. to go to the hospital and I, I started this life coaching thing. Like I have that kind of spirit, like, yeah. you know, selling lemonade when you were a kid or whatever, like yeah. what do you think that is? Like, cause it, it isn't, it, is, it isn't in everyone. Not everyone wants to start a business from scratch. Right. Right. Um, I think I mean, like for me, like I like to be my own boss. Mm. Right? Like I, I really don't like other people telling me what to do. I really don't. <laughs> and I know a lot of people exactly don't. But like, if you, you hit can... the nail on the head. <laughs> my son said that to me once. He's like, "Mom, I, I don't want to have a boss." And I'm like, 
that's because you take after me. I don't like bosses either. <laughs> yeah. Like if you, if you desperately don't want to be, have a boss, then you want to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> you want to figure out how to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> that's, that is absolutely the key. Yeah. You want to be the boss. You don't want to be bossed. <laughs> yeah. If you want to be the boss, be an entrepreneur. That's right. Yeah. Cause then, you know, then you can have ideas and you can actually, you can run with them a lot easier. Um, you, you still have to be accountable of course, and you still have to have teams that help you, but, um, but yeah. I think yeah, that's a huge it's part of that. It. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. But I, I do think, which I think is very interesting about your, your podcast listeners who obviously are people that are into making, you know, becoming better people. I really think that that is not necessarily inherent to many entrepreneurs because a lot of them just think that they know better than other people and just mm. assume that. Yeah. But I, but I, but I do think that, um, I think that understanding where your weaknesses are and being willing to work on them. Like I think probably a lot of your podcast listeners do or, or want yeah, it's like self-development, think, self-improvement yes. kind of minded people. Yeah. Which I've always kind of been, I don't know a place in life where that won't pay off for you. Yeah. Right? So whether you're That's an true. entrepreneur, veterinarian, whether you just want to be a happy human being, right. Yeah. I don't know a place where that won't pay off. And, and I've, we've talked about it before, um, <clears throat> but coaching I've you, you've been my coach for years now. And then I also had executive coaching at my last practice. Um, those things were instrumental in helping me develop things like confidence to continue with my entrepreneurial journey and helping me, um, develop perspective on what I actually want for my life, because, you know, life really pushes and pulls you in different ways, especially with vet medicine, Mm -hmm. um, and the demands that they have on us in this profession. So I think that investing in yourself and investing in self-development, investing in coaching, investing in those things, I think those are <clears throat> invaluable for people that may want to be entrepreneurs, but also just want to be, um, have a life that they love and, and develop, um, into a better human being That's Yeah, what here to do, honestly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And have a, have a better life. Absolutely. Do what you want to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Getting coached is just, I, I don't think if you've never done it before, you really get it, but man, it, it really does change you in a lot of it ways. It does. And it's humbling. It's super humbling. There have been times it's where I've come to our... like I, I just yeah. said that last night because I had somebody that signed up for a free coaching with me and um, we were having trouble getting together. And I'm like, oh, I hope, I hope she didn't chicken out because that first step of like, trying to get a coach or a therapist or whatever is really intimidating. Yeah. And the follow through is difficult, but then once you start doing it and you get to know either a coach or therapist that works for you and, you know, helps you and and unlocks some of the places that you're stuck, it's like magic. Like I just, yeah. that's why I got so excited about it. When I learned about it, I'm like, damn, I wish I would have known this when I was 20, you know? I it know. Was, I know. Uh, and I remember the first first time I even heard about it, which was, was it, maybe it was like seven years ago. Um, but I remember being like, what is this? Like, just so kind of airy fairy, it. right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> what, this coach, is, what this... is that? People still say that to me when they say, what do you yeah. do? I'm like, well, I'm a veterinarian and a life coach, life coach. What is that? Yeah. They yeah. don't know. Do it's cool. But, um, but it is, it is different, you know, than therapy and it is really, helpful for people that are trying to plan what kind of life they want to live and, um, helping keep you focused on that. So, yeah, I love it. Okay. So before we wrap up, is there anything we didn't say that we should have? Did we miss anything? I'm sure we could do this again and talk about a whole lot more stuff and we probably (laughs) will definitely. Yeah. We should definitely do it again. Um, nothing that I can think of. I mean, we touched on if you're, if you're a new vet and you're struggling, you're, you're not alone. Right. It's a really important message. Yeah. I'm not alone. Even if you're a human and, and you're struggling. Yeah, exactly. People if you're human, you're struggling. Other humans aren't struggling. Everyone is guaranteed hundred right. percent. Me, yeah. Monica, we're all struggling. Yep. Here I am. <laughs> yep. It's like this. I can tell you a lot um, of stories <laughs> in my uh, book. It's coming out soon. You can read my yes, story. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, do you have a, do you have a book coming out? Yeah. Didn't I tell when you that? coming up? No. Um, well, hopefully pretty soon. I just got it back from my editor and I got to go through it again and maybe one, one more edit. And then I think it'll be out. So I I'm love excited. that it spring. Yeah. 
Oh my God. All right. Can I buy the first copy? How do I sign yeah, up? Yeah, I'll just send you I'm, one. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm buying one. I'm going to buy one. Okay. Cool. Um, but sorry. So back to what we were saying. So I think final messages. So if you're a new vet, if you're someone that's struggling, you're definitely not alone. Um, and I think for a new vet, finding like just finding like three or four things that you can rely on when you're trying to decide medical cases is really important. So having a mentor, having that text chain with your friends, posting in your Facebook group, posting on bin, posting in Facebook groups to other vets there, send the x-rays, text the x-rays off to your friends, do all the things that you need to, to learn and become better and don't, don't feel bad about it. And then, um, and then, you know, like we talk about IDEX and Antec, I am, or, or specialists are there for you as well to bounce cases off of, do everything that you, you, if you have an inkling, if you're like, should I just double check, do it, double check it. Yeah. Um, for new vets. And then of course our books are there if they would want to, they're um, called new vet jumpstart guide. There's a general practice edition and an emergency book edition. on Amazon, on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Yeah. Um, and then senior dog vets. I can't wait to, we can't wait to come out with more stuff. And so yeah. if you go yeah, to and I senior... talked about the, the CE on a few of the podcasts, yeah. I, told, I told people about it. So hopefully they're going to go and, uh, and sign up. We would love to have them. Cool. Can't wait. To All right. So give me the, here. um, give me the websites or wherever you want to send people to find out more. Uh, for veterans on the rise, it's just veterans on the rise.com. They can go there okay. and learn more about what we do. And then for senior dog vets, it's senior dog vets.com. Okay. So just go there. Our CE links are right. And for the C's. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been great. It's been so fun. Yeah. We're going to have to do it again. So it, went by, it went by really fast. It, it did. I would love I to. Feel like it we've did. been talking that long. So this <laughs> is Dr. So Monica Tarantino. So go check out all her stuff. She's an amazing person and veterinarian and entrepreneur. And I'm sure she would help you if you have anything that you need to ask. Absolutely. Thanks for being Thanks here. Thanks so much, Julie. All right. Have a beautiful Bye. week, everyone. Bye. Bye, Monica.